not long ago that I was um, just in my daily quiet time reading scripture. And, and God, uh, he had me in 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 13. And I'm going to invite you to locate that in just the next few minutes. Uh, we'll be looking at it more closely. Um, but it was a familiar story to me, the story of Uzzah. And, uh, but for some reason, I felt that I just needed to camp out there. And so every day, I just kept going back to 1 Chronicles chapter 13. There's a parallel passage in Scripture found in 2 Samuel chapter 6 that gives the same story, uh, different details, um, all in one of the same, but just additional details. But as I was studying this, it was like, I just felt God prompting me to preach a message on Uzzah. How many of you have ever heard of a guy named Uzzah? Let me see a show of hands. Some of you, Uzzah, U-Z-Z-A or U-Z-Z-A-H, just depending on where you're at, either 1 Chronicles or 2 Samuel. And, and it's like, is this just me or is this you? When you're studying the Word of God, do you not invite God to speak to you? Do you not say, Lord, teach me. Of how can I apply this? Something that took place almost 3,000 years ago, how can I apply it in my life today? See, and that's where I was at. You see, I understood the historical context of what Uzzah did. But then I asked that so what question. It's like, okay, Lord, again, how can I apply this today? And that's where this message stems from. It is rooted in the relationship that I have with God. And I pray that it would indeed be a challenge to you. Because as your new pastor, I'm wanting to lead you in a little bit different direction. You know, this is a great church. And it's obvious to me that you love each other. You love spending time with each other. But in the midst of that, sometimes we can become too comfortable with each other, where we forget about what God has challenged and called and burdened us to do, and that is to go out and to make disciples. Many people say, well, why are we changing our traditional Sunday school format to small groups? Uh, well, there's lots of reasons for that. But one of the biggest reasons is so that we can make disciples. You see, we want to not only teach information from the Bible, but we want that information to radically transform who you are so you can become more Christ-like, reflecting His grace, love, and mercy outside the walls of this great church. Do you hear what I'm saying? But sometimes, even though we have good intentions or our motivations are pure, sometimes we can do things the wrong way. And that's where we find ourselves in this passage. So let's look at this chapter beginning at verse 1. I want to read verses 1 through 4, and then I want to advance forward to verse 9. Not that those in-between verses are not important. They are, um, but there's just words that maybe I can't pronounce, and I'm just trying to save myself from embarrassing them. No, not really. I, I'm just saying that these are the, these are the focal verses that I, that I want to pay attention more closely to. The Bible says this. Then David, that's King David, by the way. That's the very David that slew Goliath. What did he do? He consulted. He consulted with the captains of the thousands and of the hundreds and with every leader. When we look back in our study to 2 Samuel chapter 6, it says that he consulted, he met with the elite men of his day. And then in verse 2, it says, David, he said to all the assembly of Israel, everybody say all. Oh, all. all. That's important. All the assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you, let me say that again, if it seems good to you, and if it is from the Lord our God, let us send everywhere to our kinsmen who remain in all the land of Israel, also to the priests and Levites who are with them in their cities with pasture lands, that they may meet with us. In other words, David's wanting to do something big. And so he is gleaning counsel from the what the Bible says, the elite people, and in number, there are about 30,000 of them. We learn about that again in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Verse 3 picks up, and it says, And let us bring back the ark of our God to us. In other words, David's wanting to bring the ark of the covenant um, back to the capital city of Jerusalem. You see, there had been civil war in the land for many years. You see, 
God first anointed Saul to be the first king of Israel. Saul did not take serious the things of God, thus disqualifying himself from being that kingly leader. And so God chose David, a little shepherd boy, if you will, to do something great for him. And after this time of civil war, because there is a battle between the, the house of Saul and the house of David, um, there's now peace in the land. David is the established king, and he's wanting to establish Jerusalem as being that capital city. And what does he want to do? He wants to bring back Israel's most precious artifact, if you will, the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a box. It's about two feet wide, two feet deep, about four feet in length. It represented the presence of God himself. Inside this box, if you will, what, this very special box, were the Ten Commandments. There was also a little bit of the manna in a jar, and in part, Aaron's budded rod. Okay, this was a very special, symbolic artifact that, that represented the presence of God that David wanted to bring back to the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem. It's a great idea. Verse 4, Then all the assembly said, that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. Verse 9 says this, And when they came to the threshing floor of Shaddon, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark, because the oxen nearly upset it. So this is what's taking place. They're, they're heading back to Jerusalem. They have the ark of the covenant on a special um, cart, and somehow um, it becomes in unbalanced, and Uzzah reaches out, and he tries to stabilize the ark, preventing it from falling down to the ground. Verse 10, the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, so he struck him down because he put out his hand to the ark, and he died there before God. That is so unfair, if you think about it. All he was trying to do is help. Again, this morning, I want to talk to you about doing a good thing in the wrong way. Doing a good thing in a wrong way. Let me give you an example. <laughs> um, two of my four children are here today. And they've heard me preach enough messages where I pick on them. But today, I'm not going to pick on the bookends. You know, my oldest and my youngest. Instead, I'm going to target my oldest granddaughter, Avery. Avery loves to help out around the house. We have chickens. And so one day, she and I were going out to the chicken coop to collect the eggs. And she's four years old right now, and a four-year-old wants to do everything on their own. They want to help. And so here we are gathering the eggs, and I wanted to put the eggs in a little basket, but she didn't want them in a basket. She wanted to carry all the eggs herself. Okay, that's a good thing. She's wanting to do a good thing. She's wanting to help Grandpa out. So what happens? Not one of the eggs made it back to the house. <laughs> they all broke. Because as she was putting the eggs, you know, she was cracking them, she was covered with yolk, you know, and, and we just had to, but here's my point. She was trying to do a good thing, but she was doing it in the wrong way. And there's a lesson that you and I can learn from that. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. So there are two questions that I personally ask myself. Oh, and I don't know if you guys caught that. Two questions. See, I'm kind of a traditional kind of preacher. I love the three points in a poem, but today you're only going to get two points by way of a question. Two questions. That's all I'm going to ask you, because these are the very questions that I ask myself. Question number one, who do I consult? Because I want you to look at this passage again. David, he... He gathered the council of 30,000 leaders in Israel. These were, these were military leaders. These were community leaders. They were religious leaders. And he, he gets them together and he says, listen, let's do something great for God. We are no longer warring amongst ourselves. We are now united. I am the leader. God has appointed me. I am going to reign in our capital city, Jerusalem. Let's bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. It sounded good. It was a great idea. They all said, yes, absolutely, let's do it. There was only one problem. 
They were doing it the wrong way. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. But who do I consult? The Bible says in 1 Chronicles, again, 13, verse 1. You see it up on the screen. Then David consulted with the captains of the thousands and the hundreds and with every leader. So there are five questions that I want to go over. Just five questions that we can ask when we either give advice or receive advice. Are you with me? The first is, is the advice in which we are getting, is it biblical? We need to ask ourselves that question. Is it biblical? If you want to write it down, if you're taking notes, this is important. When David consulted the leaders, did the religious leaders look in the ancient scrolls, our Old Testament, and did they, did they tell David that he should not do what he was doing the way in which he was planning to do it? What do you mean? Well, we know, number one, that the ark was never to be transported on a cart. It was to be carried by faithful men of the religious lineage. And the ark had four rings, one on each corner. And there was a pole that would be slid between those rings and four men would carry the ark on their shoulders. This is how the ark had to be transported. And really to do it any other way was showing disrespect to God himself. So when you and I, when we give or receive counsel, we need to compare it to the authoritative, powerful word of God. The sons of Kohath in Numbers chapter 4 tell us exactly how this ark was to be transported. So you and I, we are embarking with, on what I believe to be this incredible, exciting journey. We're going to move from... from doing things the way that perhaps we've always done them and just tweaking them just a little bit so we can reach a lost community. And, and you're going to have leaders in this church, myself, Rusty, along with other leaders that are currently here and leaders that will eventually come into this church because I believe personally that this church is going to grow numerically because we're asking God permission to do something great on his behalf. And we need more workers to accomplish the things that I think we and you and us can do in this community. The entire Silver Valley. You see, what you and I can do not only can make an impact here in the Silver Valley, but I believe that we can make a huge crescendoing sound throughout all the world. I believe that God will raise up future missionaries, future pastors, future leaders that will do great things on His behalf in all four corners of the world. But what you and I must do is we must look at the biblical marker of truth. Think about it, just for a minute. We live in a world that is seeking out truth. Where do we hold our marker for truth? See, everybody has all these different opinions, and I understand that. But how do we discover where truth is really found? Well, for me, it's no secret. I believe that the Bible holds the truth that humanity is looking for. I really, truly believe that. You see, I know that society, secular society, they look at Christians as being weak. I understand that they look at us as being too reliant upon what they consider to be an ancient, archaic book. But I don't look at it that way. I look at this book is more than just black ink on white paper. I look at it once again as being the very word of God. And so when you and I receive or give counsel to others, we must base it on biblical precepts. The second question that I want us to ask is, the advice in which we are giving or receiving, is it factual? Is it factual? Is it based upon facts? Think about this. If we've ever read the book of Job, found in the Old Testament. Hey, hey this is something kind of, I heard a young Christian one time um, ask a question about this guy named Job. Okay, and I loved it. Because, man, he was fresh in the faith. But there is a Bible character named Job. Very interesting man. He was a faithful man of God. And don't ask me all the nuances 
of how this happened, but the devil himself, Satan, went up and asked permission to inflict and torment God's faithful. And God said, have you ever considered my servant Job? Because he's faithful, he's righteous, he's blameless, he has no sin in his life. And Satan says, well, you will never let me harm Job because you have this special hedge of protection around him. And God said, I tell you what, I will prove to you the faithfulness of, of Job by removing this hedge of protection. And you can do anything to Job except for kill him. <coughs> and so as Job is losing all of his possessions, as his family is dying all around him, as he's laying there in torment, as he's suffering from sores and diseases, he could have cursed God. But yet he was faithful. So what happened? Job's friends came and they started to give him counsel, not based upon facts, but on speculation. In their minds, they were convinced that Job had sinned against the Almighty and that God was punishing him therefore. But that was not the case. And Job has presented an argument throughout this entire book saying, listen, I've done nothing wrong. The counsel in which you're giving me is not based upon facts. And you and I must be very careful when we give counsel that we base it upon the facts that are presented before us and not on the speculation or hearsay. I've seen it. It is so easy for rumors to start in a small church. Rumors can destroy. And the advice that we sometimes give is certainly not helpful, to say the least. But we do need to ask ourselves the question, is it biblical, is it factual? I think we have a slide that shows all five of my questions. So you guys can just write those down if you like. And then the next question is, is it teachable? Is it teachable? You know, I think of, uh, I think of a guy that I pastored um, many years ago. His name is Bert Anderson. Um, Bert was an amazing individual. He's now with the Lord. Um, he was one of our senior citizens that attended a church plant that I planted in Coeur d'Alene. And, and uh, I love just to spend time with Bert. So I would go over to his house once or twice a week and we would just drink coffee and just talk about the Lord. But here's the thing about Bert. Um, he cussed like a sailor. Okay? Not like a Marine, because Marines don't, don't say swear words. Okay? You know, uh, but man, he cussed like a, he cussed like a sailor, Chuck. I'm telling you. And, uh, and I got to be honest with you, uh, I became convicted over Bert because he was always doing this around me, his pastor. And so I needed to confront Bert. I just needed to say, Bert, man, do you know that I'm a pastor? Comfortable hanging around me, you know, with some of the things you're saying. Um, so, so I knew that I was going to have to confront him because I was tired of listening to some of these awful curse words. And he, he was saying these words and he wasn't even cognitive. He wasn't even aware of the things that he was saying. It was just part of his natural speech. But I was going to have to confront him. I wanted to teach him. And you know what was really sweet about Bert? He was the kind of guy that was teachable. And before I tell you what I did, let me just tell you... Um, about the phone call that I received from his wife, Judy, the very day, just hours after he breathed his last breath here on planet Earth. She calls me up and she says, Pastor Mike, you'll never guess what happened. I have some really good news. Bert, he went to go be with the Lord in heaven. I, I, have you ever heard anything like that? It just blew me away. I'm like, Judy... Do, do you want me to come and give you a hug and, and love on you a little bit? She goes, no, I'm so thankful. Bert no longer has to suffer because he was old and he had all these things going wrong with his body. But Bert all the way to the end was teachable. So this is what I did. I said, I said, you know, Bert, you really shouldn't cuss. But I'm not saying you shouldn't really cuss around me. You shouldn't just cuss at all. And then I pulled out Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. And I said, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. So when we give advice and we give counsel to others, we need to understand that 
and ask ourselves the question, are they teachable? And if what we are saying, is it reproducible to a point where we can teach it to others? And in this context, absolutely. The fourth question, is it necessary? Is it necessary? You know, sometimes it's just good not to say anything at all. We want, we want to give advice. You know, we can't wait to give advice. We want to give our two cents. And we're looking for that opportunity. But you know, sometimes it's good just to not say anything. You know, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 that there is a time to speak and a time to be silent. I want to share with you a personal testimony. Um, many years ago, Vicki gave me the good news that she was pregnant. And I was excited. You know, I, I, I love to be a dad. And God has blessed me with four children that I can see. But there was a time that when Vicki was pregnant, there were some complications, and she miscarried. And I just broke my heart. Just broke my heart. I, I was so excited that, that God was going to bless us with another child. I was hurt. I didn't know what to say. I, I didn't blame God. I, I, just, I just knew that it was just a painful time in my life. And, uh, and a few weeks ago, we, we were celebrating Memorial Day. And almost every Memorial Day that goes by, I think about that little child, you know, wondering if it was a little boy or a little girl. You know, I don't know. But I do know that based upon Psalm 139, that that, that, little, that little being that was being formed in Vicky's womb, you know, was a gift from God. And, and on that Memorial Day weekend, I can remember Vicki and I, we, we chose not to go to church that day. Um, we chose to take a drive up to, up to British Columbia and just kind of, you know, regroup and, and gather our thoughts and composure. Um, but in all honesty, the church that I was attending, I didn't want to go. Because the pastor, in his attempt to give us counsel and to console us, hurt us or hurt me said things like, well, you know what? Maybe that was just the will of God. Um, he took that, maybe that little baby would have grown up to be the next Adolf Hitler. You know, you know maybe, maybe, maybe that child would have, would have uh, been born with, with disabilities. You know, and said all the wrong things. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, man, what if that child would have, would have grown up to be the next president of the United States? What if, that, what if that child, that little boy or girl, would have grown up and discovered the cure for cancer? All I know is that I was hurting, and all I know in addition to that is that the counsel that I received was not necessary. And you and I, when we give counsel, it must be biblical, it must be factual, it must be teachable. And it has to be necessary. There are times that you and I just simply must keep our mouths closed and not say a thing. Because it can be more hurtful than you know. Anytime we give counsel, it should always be spoken in love. Amen. You know, sometimes we love to show our biblical superiority over others. And sometimes we do it not representing the love of Christ. So I'm reading this story of Uzzah, and I'm like, God, how can I apply this to my life today? And I was reminded of the importance of where I must receive counsel. And in addition, how I can give counsel. And I would encourage you to implement these five things. There are more, but I would encourage you to implement at least these five things. Earlier I said I had two questions that I was asking myself. The first question is, who do I console? I think I addressed that. The second question is, why did Uzzah have to die. Man, that is like serious stuff. Have you ever thought that? 
Dusty, have you read that scripture oh, and yeah. just said, why? Why? <laughs> I mean, he wasn't he just trying to do a good thing? That's the whole point of this message today. He was trying to do a good thing in the wrong way. Uh, do me a favor. Turn back in Scripture to 2 Samuel. If you don't know where 2 Samuel is, don't worry about that. Just open up to the table of contents or just hold fast just for a minute and I'll read you a verse. Why did Uzzah lose his life simply by reaching out and touching the ark? Why? The answer is found in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 7. Are you there? The Bible says this, And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down there for his what? Irreverence. And he died there by the ark of God. I got to thinking about this. You see, the ark was entrusted to Uzzah and Ahio's father, Ahinadab. And, and it had been with them for a long time. And I just simply think that, that this family became very comfortable with the Ark of the Covenant in their backyard. And they were not from a priestly line. But I believe that they took ownership. They knew that they should not have done what they did, in my opinion. I believe, I believe that when they began to embark on this journey back to Jerusalem, they knew that it shouldn't have been them carrying the ark. They should have uh, submitted to the priestly authority to do just that. And here's another very disturbing thing if you think about it. The priests, none of the priests, none of the religious leaders stood up and said, wait, 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 David. We can't be transporting the ark on a cart. We're doing it the wrong way. Not one of them. Now here's the question that really, I, maybe we just need to explore in a, in, a, in a small group environment. I don't know. But the question is, is why didn't they speak up? Did they know that they were just afraid to say something? Or were they ignorant of God's word? You see, there are a lot of ignorant pastors in our churches today. There are a lot of pastors or a lot of people that fall under the category and the title of being a clergy that don't know their Bible. They're leading people astray. They're presenting to them false hope. They're presenting to them false um, theologies. They're, they're teaching people how they can touch God in the wrong way. And I want to conclude this service and make it very clear, not in what I just believe, but in what the Bible teaches. I want to present to you a message of hope that represents God's mercy saturated in the most highest degree of his love. I want to share with you a message that I have an opportunity to teach and preach all over the world. And it goes a little like this, beginning in Romans chapter 3. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Think about this just for a moment. You and I are all sinners. Darren, can you turn to this, uh, this picture of a bridge? I found this interesting. Uh, um, last Thursday, um, Vicki had met Tina down in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, Tina's driving across the country, um, beginning her journey in Alexandria, Virginia. She goes down to um, one of her houses in, in North Carolina, and then for some mysterious reason, she ends up in the Southwest, because she, by nature, is an explorer. And they spend the next four or five days um, experiencing this great adventure together and they're in the they're in the southwest and they're they're looking at all these great sites and they come across this uh, this bridge but I want you to notice something um, that this bridge is, is the conduit that allows somebody to get from one side to the other now think about what it would be like in life if there was no bridge how would you get to the other side and that's how life is. 
You see, you and I, we want to get to heaven. We want to reach out and we want to have an experience and encounter with God. But we get to the edge and there's something that separates us from ever having a relationship with God. And that is sin. For the wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6. So we know that we're all sinners. We all fall short of God's standard. We all know that sin has consequences. It has wages. You and I have earned the right to be separated from God because there's not one person here in this room that can honestly say that they are without sin. And because God is perfect, because God is holy, because God is righteous, He cannot let sin enter into His perfect place called heaven. But he has made it possible for you and I to have access to him by way of a bridge. And the bridge has a name. And the bridge hung on a cross, paying the ransom for our sin. That's right, none other than Jesus Christ himself. Think about it. Isaac was trying to reach out and touch God. The presence of God himself represented through the Ark of the Covenant. <clears throat> Humanity today, I am convinced, is trying to reach out. They're trying to find answers to, to those questions of life, those $64,000 questions. Why am I here? And is there more to life than just living and dying? Is there something beyond? And the answer to the question is yes. This life would be, would be miserable, in my opinion, if God did not intervene on our behalf. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> I wasn't planning on preaching this, but it just came to me, and I just feel like I need to share this with you. You see, I believe that God has placed within every single person... An ability to know that he exists. I believe that with all my heart. I'm going to give you some counsel here in just a minute. Some biblical counsel reinforced by facts and is absolutely teachable. And it is necessary for me to present. And I'm going to do it in love because that's what God did. Because the Bible says that in Romans chapter 5. But God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He provided a way for us to get to God. And there are people that I encounter that say, well, I don't believe in God. I just believe that, you know, I'm, I was born and I'm going to die. And that's it. Or, or, or when I die... Because I'm a good person and I've done good things, I'm going to go to heaven. Because certainly all the good things that I have done are going to overshadow and outweigh all the bad things that I have done. Well, if that's the case, then let's just go ahead and open up to our Bible in, in, in Ephesians chapter 2 and just rip that page out. That says, for by grace are we saved through faith, not of ourselves. Because if we can save ourselves, then we can boast. We can say, look at what I have done. And I'm standing before you today saying, it's not about what you and I have done. It's all about what Christ has done on our behalf. And so when people tell me, well, I don't believe in God. Or I don't think there's a God. Or I'm just a good person. I know God's not going to punish me. Look at what Romans chapter 1, verse, beginning at verse 18 says, concluding at verse 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident, now listen to this, don't miss this, within, within them. Say that, within. For God made it evident to them. So somebody's lying. Is God lying, or are the people that we encounter lying? Well, I think you know where I stand. Verse 20. For since the creation of the world, His invisible, say that word, invisible, invisible. 
See, you and I, we look at the visible. We see the mountains. We see this, the, the awesomeness of God's creation. But this is talking about the invisible attributes, the things that are within. His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. In other words, there's not one soul that is going to breathe their last breath that's going to fall on their face before for God and say, I didn't know. Because the Bible clearly teaches that God has placed that knowledge within them. It's just up to them to respond. So let me conclude by saying, number one, uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned, we all fall short of God's glory. Secondly, Romans chapter 6, for the ways of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I've already quoted Romans chapter 5. That's right, I'm going through the book of Romans now. <laughs> for God demonstrated his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He died on a cross for us. He took our place. Amen. Our place. And the Bible says that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. You see, it's all or nothing. Let me give you an example. I have two closing illustrations. I'll try to be brief. Illustration number one. I enjoy traveling. And God, is, God has really blessed me over the years where I can go to the different and the various regions of the world to go present the gospel. From Central to South America to Africa. And I'm just so thankful that I can do it. And I always look forward to doing it. But before I go anywhere, I have to prepare for the journey. I must prepare. So I need to make sure that my passport is in order. I need to make sure that I jump on um, the website to the airline that I'm going to be flying on and reserve a ticket, which means I'm going to have to pay for that ticket. Okay? I'm going to have to show up at the airport the day the, the flight is scheduled to leave. Are you with me so far? I have to go through all these security checkpoints. I have to wait in these long lines. Tina, can you relate? And finally, I get to a point, after I've shown my passport, after the agent looks at my picture, looks at me, confirms that the two match, they allow me to go through the metal detector. So what happens if I walk through the metal detector and I have a pocket knife? I've done everything right, but I have just a little pocket knife. And I walk through the metal detector that disqualifies me from getting on that plane. And that pocket knife represents sin in our life. We can do all the right things. But if we have just one sin in our life, that disqualifies us from crossing over that bridge, if you will. Doing things, good things, the wrong way. When Vicki and I were in Malawi, um, we had an opportunity to do what's called an open-air revival. An open-air revival is like what you see me doing right there. See all these people in this village, that's me preaching, that's my friend um, translating for me. And um, man, I, I, just, I just fell in love with this pastor. I loved his heart. And this pastor, he was so zealous about leading lost people to Jesus and to planting churches all over Malawi, Africa. You know, he just welcomed anything that, that we could do to help him uh, to obtain this Christ-like and kingdom-minded goal. And so one day he says, Mike, let's do an open-air revival. And uh, he says, is there any way in order to attract people that, uh, that you can give me a little bit of kwacha, a little bit of money, so we can buy some, some little gifts, like some soda pop and some chips and, and, and some Bibles and some things of this nature. And, and, and I'm thinking, man, maybe we should buy some soap. You know, maybe we should buy, you know, some food items like rice, because that's what the people needed most. But this pastor said, you know what? No, let's, let's see if we can get as many people gathered as possible. Because the more people that come, the more opportunities we have to see God win out the day. 
And it's like, okay, so I give him some money. But I also wanted to bless him with some additional money. Because he's a pastor, and the average pastor makes about what is equivalent to $25 a month. Our, our currency. Okay? And, uh, and most of these pastors kind of work for free. Um, I wish I knew what that was like, but uh, that's a joke. <laughs> okay? Um, so, so I, gave, I gave him about $125. But he took, I think, that $125, and he spent it all on trinkets, if you will, to give out to people. And Vicki and I are, are sitting off to the side as, as they have more items than I think they had people that they were giving, and our hearts were broken. I'll be honest with you. It, it, it missed where we wanted it to go. He was, doing, he was doing a good thing, but he was doing it the wrong way. And I walked away thinking, all these people, they came because they were going to get something for free. Hear what I'm saying? They wanted to get something for free, but they were walking away from the one thing that we wanted to give them that was free. How's that for confusing you? In other words, sometimes when we go out and we reach a community, we do things. We do block parties. We, do, we give things away. We try to lure people to come to our events. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, you know, if it's on a small scale, but I don't think we should ever do it on a large scale. Because let me tell you something, that uh, people live in the flesh, and if they know that they can get a free bicycle or, or, or a, a free, you know, case of Pepsi or something like that, man, they're going to show up to your event, but that's the only reason they are there. And you know what? I can't tell you how many times over the years I've walked away from events like that doing a good thing in the wrong way where I've just been like, Lord, the one free thing that we wanted to give away, they didn't want. Now, what is that free thing? That's God's grace. It doesn't cost us anything. Nothing. Nothing. But it cost him everything. I like that music there, man. I could preach with that, man. Just keep going, brother, man. I could... I could preach like a black man in a black church. <laughs> you relate to that? I'm telling you, man, those guys, they can preach. <laughs> Woo! <coughs> it's free. <clears throat> David consulted the wrong people. Not one time in Scripture does it show that he consulted with God first. He consulted with man. God help the churches in America today where the pastors and the leadership of the church is not consulting his will first, but submitting to the will of the people because so often the will of the people is so far away from the will of God, it would surprise you. This church, beginning two weeks ago, ended up hiring a pastor that is committed to teaching you the <clears throat> principles of God and doing things God's way than opposed to our way. And the greatest thing that we could give to our community is the message of hope through Christ. That is the greatest gift that you and I could possibly ever give. And it will not be easy. It will be hard. Right now we're in this waiting phase. And as we're waiting, of course, we're praying and preparing. We're preparing for a fall. 
midweek service launch. We're preparing for children's ministry. We're preparing our building to be able to host all of these things. I, I'm, asking, I'm asking people to go way beyond their comfort zone. I'm inviting who I have identified to be a future pastor to step up to the plate and do something great for God. And I know that it's going to require sacrifices. But as I'm asking him to do great things, I, that means I also have to take things that he has been doing away from him to free him up to do the things that I believe God has called him to do. So don't anybody walk away from this church today complaining that, there, that, that there's new screens up on the wall, or that we have no bulletin, or, or we're changing the landscape, or we're doing anything like that. Okay, because we're doing it because all we want to do is just go out into the community and tell people where they can receive hope and freedom through the blood of Jesus. Amen. It's that simple. It's that simple. Which also means that I'm going to be asking some of you to do some things that you probably have never dreamed that you can do. But I believe that you can do it. And so for my two-point message that I thought was going to be short is now turning into something that's going to be somewhat long. Okay, because I just feel I just feel like I'm just beginning to start preaching right now. Thank you, Darren, for the music. Woo. So uh, is there someone here that doesn't know Jesus? Think about that. Did you know that I read an article not long ago that talked about one of the greatest evangelistic fields for any evangelist is within the church itself? You see, I believe that there are a lot of lost people that attend religious social clubs called church. But is there someone here today that has never surrendered their life to Jesus? They're wanting to, they're wanting to reach out. They're wanting, to, they're wanting to get close to God, but they just don't know how to do it. They, they maybe have been doing it the wrong way. They, they maybe have been doing it through good works. They, they may be doing it for, for different theological um, arguments. You know, I, I, I'm a Calvinist. God has chosen me. He's predestined me. You know, I'm saved. Well, how do you know you're saved? Just because you claim a title or a tag doesn't mean you're saved. I'll tell you how you know you are saved. You are saved when you fall on your face before God and you repent of your sins and you say that you're sorry and you understand what Jesus has done for you by dying on the cross. He saved you from his wrath. Amen. He saved you from eternal separation. He paid the price. It was you and I that were condemned. We were standing, if you will, before a judge, guilty, knowing that our punishment was deserving of death. The judge is about ready to take the gallon and slam it down on a piece of wood. And he's about ready to sentence you. And all of a sudden, someone who had never committed a crime comes up and says, hold on, judge, stop, stop. Let me take their place. Let me take their place. I will die so they don't have to. Let me do it. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He built a bridge. And so I'm reading the story of Uzzah. This, this man that is trying to do a good thing. He's just doing it the wrong way. He took God for granted. He was irreverent. He disregarded the way. And you know what Jesus says? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Wow. I'm going to go home. I'm going to read First Chronicles chapter 13. <laughs> I'm going to go home and read Second Samuel chapter 6. I'm going to see if I get that. Uh, it's there. Who do you receive counsel from? How do you give counsel? And why did Uzza have to die? Those were the two questions that I gave. You may come up with a whole bunch more questions than I came up with. Because you're probably a whole lot smarter than I am. Would you stand with me? We're going to close the service. I'm going to send you on your way. We're not going to...